I liked in the shades. Thank you, sir. Dave Horrocks. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you, sir. It's good to speak to you again. It's been ages, hasn't it? I'm trying to think. It's over a, long a year, time. isn't it? It is over oh, a year, yes. I think. Easily a year. Uh, I can't remember. I was The last time you were on was for the first season of What If, maybe? Or maybe, maybe you were on for a Hawkeye episode? I'm not sure. But it's been a long time. I think it might be it might have been uh one division or something like that. It might have been one of the first and uh, No 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 no. You were definitely on for what if we did the uh the zombies episode oh. together for sure. Uh that, that checks out. I do like yeah. the old Marvel zombies. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, I remember you requested that specifically. So yeah, the glasses, <laughs> um I don't know if you know this, but like we're about to have a a, a major total solar eclipse here in the next couple of days. So we're all geared up with the uh, with the glasses, and I thought they kind of had a '90s vibe, a very jubilee kind of. Definitely do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but that's not going to work for the episode because I literally can't see anything through those. Um, so, yeah, dude, it's great to have you back. I know I, I wanted to have you on because you know we met in an X Men group basically, yeah. and we're both big fans of the Uncanny X cast, and that's that's where we first came together. And so I'm trying to get people on who love the X-Men, who, you know, have some skin in the game here and like care about the X-Men showing up now with Marvel Studios and what that's looking like. So um, what have you thought so far of just just this series, kind of the first X-Men thing we have gotten since Marvel Studios bought 20th Century Fox? I mean, I think it's awesome. I think it's uh, it's everything that I was hoping it'd be, and yep. uh, and a bit more as well. I, and I think I know you were discussing last week as well that, that you know it's a little bit more mature than the original series. Yeah, and I do. I genuinely think this this is made for us. This yeah. is for for the fans who came through, and you know you hear so many comic book creators that say, "Oh, this is where we started." Was the X Men animated series. And uh, I just think they've done a great, great job. I mean, my so my almost my comic book origin started with uh, it was classic X Men number one in 1986. I remember going to the store and I saw that Artley. Uh, oh, who is it? Is it? It's not. It wasn't Jim Lee. Or was it Art Adams? I can't remember, but it, it was an amazing piece of artwork with Wolverine at the front, and you had Colossus at the side, Storm. You had all the all the X Men. I was like, "What the hell is this?" And and you're surrounded by stuff like Spider Man, Superman, Batman. You know, just mm. growing up as a kid, I was like, "What is this?" And it was actually a reprint of uh, Giant Size. So I only found that out years later. So it was years before it originally came out, but for me, it was brand new. And that was it. I was hooked on X-Men. I, I just had to know more about these characters. And that was what really kicked off everything for me. So even when it came around in the early 90s, I mean, I, I was pushing my mid to late teens then. I, I was a little bit old <laughs> to be watching uh, cartoons, but I, st I still loved it. And yeah. the only thing is, I remember, you know, in, in the UK, the, the episodes didn't seem to always be sequential They'd right. had, and not at the same time. So if you weren't up at the same time or like you'd be up at the same time on a Saturday morning, but they'd show it like maybe an hour later or they've shown it before. It was, it was all over the place. Yeah. So it was only years later when I got back and was able to fill some gaps. I, might, I must have seen like Night of the Sentinels, like. 10 times or something like that. It was always like the same ones over and over. But yeah, I think um, it's great to have some of the original voice acting talent, you know, back. And, you know, obviously they, they've drafted in some new people as well. But I, I really like where they've gone with some of the storylines. Not, not necessarily this week as much, but we'll, we'll get into mm -hmm. that, I'm sure. Yes, um, I think I agree with you. Uh, I, th this week, isn't as strong as the previous three i mean still a solid piece like i think if you compare it to this the series from the 90s you're still getting some pretty awesome stuff here um and a, and, and a great bit of nostalgia this week too like very very 90s um and I, I love that like anytime they can inject something that 
just brings back those childhood memories you know mm. that the i i mean i i've absolutely loved the first three episodes and i think that they were getting better as they went i think first second and then third episode they actually somehow got better with each one and you always worry like when's there going to be an episode that's not as great and for me that was this one right this one it, it was good it was still good and it was a it was a cool time it, it was fun uh but it just didn't hit quite the same dramatic beats for me as um the first the first two or the first three um one thing, let me ask you what you think about this. They they did this a lot in the comics um, and in the original 90s animated series. They they would have these one-off episodes or like kind of pigeon pigeonholed in there. Like they they would put they would put in an episode that was just random fun. Uh, mm. And it didn't really have a lot to do with the story, like Jubilee's Fairy Tale Theater, right? And they did this in the comics too. They did a lot with uh, uh, Kitty Pride had a thing where, like, she she would tell a story, mm. and it, it, they would inject all the X Men characters into it. So, like, Wolverine would be like a little bestial guy, and you know, there'd be like Prince Prince Summers and uh, Princess Gray, you know, things mm. like this, like, um kind of making fairy tale stories out of x-men characters and i've never been a big fan of that those sort of thing those are issues i just want to get i just want to get to the next one i want to get back to the x-men story that we were telling yeah 100 percent. I'm, I'm with you there i mean i say i'm a huge x-men fan but when, when i was thinking about it before we we came on here i was thinking well yeah i i really don't care for the mojo verse stuff i don't care <laughs> yeah. for dupe uh, I don't like it when the X Men are in space. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. like, but apart from that, you know, it's the street level stuff. Yeah, you know, we've always. got like, you know, Magneto's hinting. You know, he, he, even last week, you know, he was hinting about. Uh, oh no, it was, it was in this episode where they're they're talking about Jubilee's birthday and everything, and mm-hmm. then goes over to Magneto. You know, <laughs> I lost my parents in my childhood or whatever it was he said. You know, it's it's hinting. At yeah. some of his uh, past, you know, and that's gritty, gritty stuff. And yeah. Uh, yeah, you just get to the the nonsense of the the Mojo verse, and it it, mm-hmm. it just loses me a bit. I mean, I'm still going to watch it, I'm still going to read it, but uh, it, it's my least favorite aspect of the X Men. I have to say. Yeah, I think I think for me, I like aspects of the Mojo verse because, like I said, it, it gave a chance for them to inject some serious nostalgia, nineties video games into this episode. And back in the nineties, when he, when he appeared on the show, it was all about television. Right. And Mm. so they would inject and it it would be like versions of your favorite TV shows or your parents' favorite TV shows. Yeah. You know, but with the X-Men stuck in there, like that concept is fun, you know, but just the idea that it doesn't it doesn't seem as consequential it doesn't seem as like there aren't the stakes don't seem as high when they're in an alternate reality or something you know um the mojo verse or inside of a video game it it doesn't even though they he says something along the lines like well if you die in the game you die in real life something like that (laughs) but even with that it doesn't feel like the stakes are as high as when they're dealing with earthbound stuff in real life in our universe yeah, it, it just feels like a one shot, doesn't it? Just like this yeah. throwaway, silly little story. I guess the the only thing of consequence might be that you know there's this spark between her and Roberto. Um, yeah. You know, but I, I mean, they'd sort of been hinting at that along the way. But for me, I did like the fact that you know the arcade graphics that they they kind of yes. put together. It was very much like those old old arcade games, and it did make me feel nostalgia for um, you know uh, just arcades. And I'd say if yeah. I ever like come into some amount of you know fuck you boss money, you know like I, I think I'd have to set my, set up arcades and video shops. You know, just yeah. I know you don't need a video shop, but just do you remember just going to Blockbusters and or whatever and just walking around and just, hey, you, you meet your mates down there or whatever? And it was an experience, wasn't it? Whereas now yeah. you're flicking through Netflix or whichever ever streaming service. So I think 
you know, society needs things like that, you know, and, and definitely the arcade. I absolutely love the arcades. And so I, yeah. I love what they did with the the graphics and, and it made made it feel like those old platform games. Like there was a lot of care and attention that went into that. Definitely. They uh so they, they brought in aspects of X Men the arcade game, which was very popular, right? Um especially in those first two levels that they that they showed them in. Yeah, uh, it was like them fighting the Sentinels in the first level. It looked very much like the arcade game, and then off to the Savage Land and the second one with Sauron. And I, yeah, it felt like that. And then also, if you notice when they first, and we'll go through the episode here, but like when they first get into the video game, uh, before they when they set up the console, or the console's already there which magically. It's already there, Motendo. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if you look, the cartridge is the original like Sega Genesis X Men game cartridge it's like the yeah. same cover on it and i was like oh it's so cool like you know it's like i had that i had that i know exactly what that cover looks like it just brings back lots of memories so uh all yeah. of it the 16-bit graphics in a cartoon were fantastic yeah and did you notice as well when they they first got pulled into the the mojo verse the the way uh jubilee and, and roberto were kind of brought in and then they had all the the circuitry coming up their yeah. face did it remind you of like superman 3 that, that yeah scene yeah, where she, yeah I, I wasn't sure if that was an homage but you can tell with this series that almost no expense no expenses spared you know, with mm. the original series, they had to, you know, cut their cloth. They, they didn't have unlimited budget. But you can yeah. tell this is, there's all these tiny little Easter eggs in there. It, this is made yeah. by people who really know their stuff. And they know that you're going to have podcasts like this, you know, YouTube things going on, looking for all these tiny little Easter eggs and stuff. Yeah. And the fans are going to love it and they're going to love spotting it. And so it, it this is what separates it from the original series for me, where, where you've just got all these extra layers that, that weren't there before. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's what's made the MCU so special through the years is having that same sort of, you know, able to be discussed and talked about and speculated on and, and uh, discovering all the Easter eggs like this. It's been, a staple of the MCU almost from the beginning, you know, is just inserting yeah. little things that comic book fans would appreciate. And uh, I, I think that's what, that was part of the magic of the, especially the first three phases of the MCU. Um, and I think something that they kind of got away from in the, in the fourth phase and mm. trying to tell the story they were telling, it wasn't as much coming from a place of fandom. I don't feel like, um, or maybe it's maybe it was just the genre. Maybe it was like the the generational thing. Like they're showing kind of more modern characters and maybe some characters that weren't invented until the last decade. You know, mm. bringing in bringing in Ms. Marvel and um, some storylines like Secret Invasion and stuff like that. I feel like maybe that was part of it. Maybe it's just me because I'm like, I'm older and maybe younger people would appreciate it. But it, it seems as though even the younger audience isn't loving the MCU as of late. So maybe they took a stab at it and it just didn't, didn't grab hold like they thought it would. Yeah. Now here's a, here's a question I want to ask you. So with things like what if it mm -hmm. folded into the MCU, there is basically yeah. in the last few years, there is nothing that is not connected in some way. Now, we're right. all just watching this going, yeah, this is brilliant. It's the X-Men. You know, it's, it reminds us of the 90s and how great is this? But do yeah. you think that they might just fold something in to, to have some kind of link to the MCU in some way? I think maybe the better question is, should they? And my answer is no. Yeah. I don't. I don't think so, man. I think um, especially with... Now, if they go live action and they they start to fold things in and then maybe veer more towards the X-Men stories and away mm. from the Avengers stories, keeping them kind of separate, you know, like the comics where you got X-Men universe, you got the Avengers over here doing their thing. And every once in a while, some things would cross over. They would do a mm. big storyline. But most of the storytelling was done, you know, 
with X-Men characters, with Avengers mm. characters, like that, kept separate. I think I would like them to do that with mm. the X-Men, but for this series specifically, I think just leave it alone, man. I think just leave this as a nostalgia piece that is um, for fans of the original series, fans of X-Men, and, and also just to get people excited about the X-Men characters, kind of mm. like the original series did for a lot of kids. It, I, My knowledge of X-Men was originally from the animated series. So mm. everything I knew before I picked up an X-Men comic, I knew who the X-Men were and what their powers were and kind of the structure of the team and Professor X leads the team, all this, all that stuff I found out from the animated series. Mm. And so I'm hoping that this works in, in sort of the same way to get people hyped up. When they finally did a live action film in 2000, it, it was in no way connected to the animated series, but yeah, it helped. If you had seen the animated series, you were pumped for this live action movie. So I'm hoping it has the same effect now without needing to connect it at all. Yeah. So I guess what I'm thinking, it, it, it wouldn't be in, connected in a major way because mm. I think they, they played around so much. They, they took a lot of liberties, didn't they, with uh, certain storylines. You know, like the whole Goblin Queen thing was, was fast-tracked, really. And mm -hmm. I, I just think you couldn't fold it in in a major way. But, you know, in Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness, you know, yeah. when he's traveling through all the universes and stuff, yeah. I, I just wonder if at some point, you know, or is Deadpool, Deadpool's surely going to make some reference or, you know, you would have thought yeah. in the in the upcoming movie. But I don't know. I, I don't know why I would really geek out over that. But if Doctor Strange just actually accidentally popped his head through, uh, you know, and, and spotted the X-Men animated series, I <laughs> so, all right, yeah. well, let's put that back in its box. Yeah, that would work. I think for a bit of fun. Uh, I don't. What I don't need though is for them to uh, make it so that something that happens in X Men in the animated series matters in yeah. the larger MCU. Um, you know, what if literally took from the live action films and imagined different versions of what would happen mm -hmm. in this animated series. Um, so it was kind of connected and it made sense with the X-Men. I don't feel like um, they don't have that to play with for one, uh, mm. but, but two, I think it would be fun. Like you said, I, if Deadpool or Dr. Strange popped in or like they're falling through these different uh, universes and mm. one of them happens to be an animated one, they're like, what yeah. the hell? And they, and they see themselves as animated and they're like, what is going on? And then, you know, just a quick little thing though. Not like don't spend a lot of time there. Yeah. 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 I can see that. I can see liking that. All right. So this episode was, was a little different from the first three. Um, not only was it kind of a departure from the main storyline, at least for half of it, but it was a, it was a split in half episode, which I'm not sure if they could have done that better. Like maybe they didn't have enough or think that the Mojo storyline would work good enough to carry a full episode um, or what? So cause I was like, why don't they just do 11 or 12 episodes? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. For the season and do a whole Mojo verse and then a whole life death. Like it doesn't make sense for them to, to, to do it like 15 minutes of this or 20 minutes of this, 10 minutes of this story. Uh, but it, it definitely made the Mojo episode Motendo go really quickly. It felt like they had to rush through everything when they were playing the different levels. Like I said, they do the first, second, third, and then a boss fight. Mm. They went through those. I mean, you spent 15 seconds, maybe in each level, 20 seconds. It was really rushed. It's a really weird choice, isn't it? Because, I mean, Disney before, if you look at something like The Mandalorian, they didn't seem to care how long the episodes were. You know, right. some of the other series, so some of them, you know, as, as soon as the episode drops, you're like, oh, this, oh crap, this one is 20 minutes with 10 minutes of credits at the end. You know, or yeah. this one, oh, yeah, brilliant. It's it's like 40 minutes. I'm sure WandaVision, but it was the same. Yeah. So... I don't see why they couldn't have just said, right, we'll have the the Mo, what was it, Mojendo? Uh, Mo Motendo, Mo wasn't it? Mojendo. Um, 
so why they couldn't just have, have had a shorter episode or or if you're really going to have a a very short episode i mean you could pad it out i guess or or just have mm-hmm. a short episode one week that, that for me would have yeah. been preferable to having it felt like the real meat of the episode was spent on that and then you just yeah. have this sort of start of a new story Mm-hmm. you're like where the hell is this going I, I i don't know is it to create a cliffhanger or create some suspense to make you want next week I, just re I, i'd love to know actually like what is the thinking behind that because it's very odd I, I can't think of another example where someone's done that i mean if you go back to the original series they know they've got a particular time slot so you know about 20 minutes you need to keep a, each episode so you're yeah. going to craft the story. Sometimes you're trying to cut things out because you've got too much, or sometimes you're trying to pad things a little bit. So they could have padded it out if they'd have wanted to. And, and it's just a really yeah. weird uh, decision for me, artistically. Yeah. No, I, I agree 100%. I think that... And and also the, the sharp contrast of the episode's kind of themes. You know what I mean? Like... Mm. They were wildly different. They didn't in any way fold into another. It was kind of like, yeah. you know, c- kind of, you know how when you watch a show and you're you're dealing with different characters in different places, which X-Men comics do this a lot. You spend uh, a page or two with a set of characters, but then the other X-Men are off on some other mission. You get to find out what they're doing for a couple pages. I feel like this almost would have worked better if they just made it like that. Like, oh, this mm. is what Storm, Storm's up to right now. This is Jubilee stuck in the Mojo verse. Instead, they just made all Jubilee focus for the entire episode, and then the Storm story. And I feel like there was definitely a better way to do that. Um, mm. and, and the Mo- the Mojo story was short, but it wasn't too short that they couldn't have made it one episode. It was right around twenty minutes, and then mm. there was about ten ten minutes maybe of the the Storm storyline. So, it just feels like you could have done. Maybe it had more to do with the fact that the Storm storyline was a little too long for one episode, but not quite long enough to fill two. Yeah. I, Maybe. I, I don't know. I, I, this The reason I really want to know is because, you know what, if they gave us a 40-minute episode of Storm mm-hmm. and Forge and, and you know, he yeah. manages to bring her powers back or something, you know, I'm not quite sure where they're going to go with this season. But that would have been okay, you know, because people yeah. would have seen, you know, straight away, oh, it's 40 minutes or 60 minutes, whatever it is. Like, oh, brilliant. Yeah. You know, we love it. So I, I don't, yeah. again, with streaming, you don't have to pad, you know, exactly that same time slot because you know you've got that time slot on the network yeah. channel, or, you know, at whatever t- uh, day it is. So, yeah, just just a weird one, really. Yeah, I do feel like, I do feel like too, like it's okay to split the uh, life death episodes. Like I get, you want to build anticipation for the next week. You could totally do a a part one and part two, but this just felt like it just felt cheap. It felt like you get half of a part one. Yeah. And then part two is actually like part two and part three, you know, it's like a Mm -hmm. split into thirds rather than split in half. And I think it was just for me, the main thing though, is that they were just such drastically different stories it was like watching two completely different episodes, mm. but watching it in one one episode of the series. So, was not a big fan of that. Yeah, because you can't imagine they'll connect in any way. I mean, oh, like, if they like did, the Mojo Verse, no. Like the Mojo Verse and Storm and Forge, yeah. No. That'd be the only way I could justify it in my head. Is that you know this. Mm madly connects or maybe storm has to go back and somehow gets her powers back from the mojo verse or something like that that'd be the only way i could justify it but yeah we'll see yeah uh so we pretty much covered i feel like pretty much covered the motendo episode Mm. so let's talk let's talk a little bit about this this first part of life death um I think everyone was probably wondering after Storm left in episode two, right? Episode two is when she leaves at the end of the episode, leaves the X-Men powerless, um, really kind of like devastating, heartbreaking letter that she wrote to Jean and the X-Men. 
Um, powerful stuff, man. Like real dramatic kind of grown up storyline. And I like that a lot, but you know, people are, I like that they pat, like put an episode between mm-hmm. and had yeah. more story with the X-Men. And now we're going to find out what happened with, with storm. Uh, she's off on her own and she runs into to forge. We saw that at the end of uh, episode three, I think they showed her mm-hmm. running into forge at a bar and then or cafe or whatever. And then it seems like they kind of hit it off and somehow ends up, she's staying with him on his ranch and they are riding horses together. They're bonding. It seems like there's some romantic feelings happening there, getting really close. And, um, he's trying to help her to get her powers back if possible. And, you know, there, there comes a point where he admits to her that he actually was the one that fathered the technology that mm. took her powers away and to her, it's like devastating. So what do you make of that whole, like, you know, the whole them bonding kind of looks like the maybe are falling in love and then the you know that shattering her idea of everything because finding out that that he created this stuff yeah i think i haven't read it for years but um i i think this is back to the old uh uncanny 186 where where they have the life death sort of storyline and and I, I think it's the same there as well that forge is is the one who created the technology um what i would say is there is a lot of romance in this uh yeah. in this season isn't there it's just the whole um like magneto and rogue thing like yeah. right there in front of remy just seems really weird to me like i can't tell if he knows about it or you know i it was genuinely funny last week when morph was like scrolling through you know the danger yeah. room i don't i don't know what what contraptions uh, does the danger room double up as a red room or something i i'm not sure but <laughs> um yeah so i i thought it again it, it was that mature kind of audience mm-hmm. wasn't it telling that yeah. kind of love story if you like or i i, I mm-hmm. thought it was good and you know he calls her a goddess doesn't he and you know he's yeah. very much enamored with her it seems and you know again what what i liked about the old claremont stuff is it's not just flip a switch and then and then everything's fixed you know yeah. he's trying to you know get her powers back but she's not She's not able to do it, and see her kind of wrestling with that as well. And then, what I thought was going to be like the Shadow King, and it's, it's yeah, the ad- that's what ad- I thought. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's that's typically your your Storm kind of villain, isn't it? But uh-huh. I mean that was quite terrifying. Again, yeah. just the the maturity of the season. Um, it, it's just a bit more than what it was when we were watching it on Saturday morning cartoons. <laughs> Yeah, I was shocked when when the adversary in that owl form yeah. bit Forge and that like just showed his uh shoulder just being chomped on. Yeah. Oh yeah, it, it was terrifying. It, this not only this episode but like the last week's episode had a lot of dark uh imagery in it and it was like demons and um you know just like it was all kind of scary. You had the thing crawling out of the TV to Uh, go after Roberto that was like his mother but then he came out of his mother's mouth it was like it was it was wild and um I like it man I love this this more mature take it's it's kind of like it's kind of like um you know when you're in some sort of fandom and you're growing up with it almost like I guess I guess the only thing I can think of like in recent memory that kind of did this was like the Harry Potter books I feel like they grew with the audience so like the first one was very much um for kids and then it became more ya and then it continued to become more and more mature as the audience was maturing that fell in love with the first book and i feel like that's kind of what this feels like it's like it needed to grow up a little bit with the audience for them to still enjoy it so i'm really enjoying that the the dark themes the I mean, Wolverine said the word pissed, which is something you would never hear on Saturday morning. Um, And just way more like, 
I, there's blood in this series. Yeah, I never yeah. saw an ounce of blood in uh, the original series ever. Um, in fact, the X Men, the only thing they would ever fight is robots and aliens, right? Yeah. Like, because you can do whatever you want to robots and aliens, but you can't really hurt a human being. So I like that a lot. That was, that's something like when that owl attacks, and then we find out at the very end that he, he announces like that his, he is the adversary. Mm. Which I didn't know anything about the adversary. I looked it up, and uh, it, it sounds it. I don't know if it was part of that life death story or not, or if that was Shadow King in that version. But I honestly, can't remember. It's honestly years, and I keep threatening to mm. go back to the Claremont run and and sort of run yeah. through it all again. But uh, probably I will do after this series. But too much other content, man. Not just the MCU stuff. But <laughs> yeah, there is a lot of good content on there that I'm trying to watch. Yeah, absolutely. I um I so I I looked at who the adversary was because I just wanted to find out like who is this villain? I know it's an established villain, but I didn't know anything about power set or how long he's been around in the Marvel universe whatever. And it sounds like he goes back to like prehistory and it's like this mm-hmm. almost demonic entity that was revered or feared by the Cheyenne people. Mm. Uh, and there was a connection with Forge, so it makes sense for it to be involved in this story. And yeah. at some point, it had something to do with the uh, Storm losing her power storyline. So Storm loses her powers, um, and then the adversary in the comics convinces Storm that um that forge is doing something wrong mm. when in reality, the goal of the adversary is to, he comes from a universe of chaos, which he loves. And he wants mm-hmm. to bring that into the, he wants to destroy this universe and replace it with his own. So, uh, very, very, very comic booky kind of villain. Like, you know, I will bring my universe here and, yeah. uh, like Thanos in, in, you know, battle of <laughs> New York. Right. I want to bring my world here. So it's, I mean, it's cool. I, I, I had never read anything about the adversary. I'm currently making my way through the Claremont run for the first time. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, I'm on, and I'm getting close to this storyline. As you said, it's in the one eighty. So, um, I'll be coming up on that really soon. So that, uh, that's, I'm kind of I'm looking forward to see what the differences are with what they did here because, like you said, with uh, the Goblin Queen and stuff, they kind of mm. they rush it along. You know, they they tell the story as quickly as possible and make it into a thirty minute episode. So, yeah, yeah. So, what are you making of the Claremont run? I mean, th- those are dense, aren't they? You can't just breeze your way through those comics, <laughs> right? Well, what I did is because I I pretty much know because of the Uncanny X cast, I know the first sixty six, and I mm. know that it's kind of a, a a hard to trudge through those first sixty six. So, yeah, I skip yeah, yeah. I skipped those. Like I, you know, I know what they are. I started with Giant Size, mm. and then just started yep. working my way through, and um. You know, most people's opinion, it's the greatest era of X Men that has ever been, and some of the the all the storylines are continuously played out over and over again. We return to those worlds, the Savage Land, the the uh, Days of Future Past, like all these things that they the Phoenix. It weaves in and out of even current day stories. So, um, I mean, how many times have they adapted Phoenix on uh, animated series films? Yeah, it, it, it's wild. So, uh, I'm really enjoying it, Re- like more than I thought I would. Honestly, I thought like, okay, yeah, it's great. But most of the people who say it's great probably read it when they were in prime age to read it, and so mm-hmm. their memory of it is like, I'm a 14 year old and I'm reading this, and it's amazing. And uh, Kitty Pride is like the same age as me, so it feels like you know they, they get this POV character where. You know, I'm reading this as a 40 year old man. It doesn't, it, <laughs> Kitty Pride doesn't quite hit the same way. Um, but I'm still, I'm just appreciating the uh, mature concepts of it. You know, the idea is that um, they didn't dumb it down for the audience, the kid, kids that were reading it. It was some high concept stuff. Like 
you know, time travel and being able to change, uh, change the future by altering the present or the past mm. and just kind of some high concepts for a, for a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old, you know, to be taking in. So I like that a lot about it. So it's keeping my interest. Every one isn't a banger, you know, I mean, like yeah. I said, I just, yeah, I just yeah. read a, yeah, I just read a Kitty Pride, uh, you know, tells Ileana a story. That was like the entire issue is her telling this make believe story that she injected the X Men into. So I'm like, mm, that's fine. But I wanted to get back to the the storytelling. I love everything so far, though. I'm having a great time with it. But you must have been. Uh... So one eight two. Have you been through like Days of Future Past? Yes, I'm. Uh, past I'm in the one. 40s. Yeah, I'm in the one sixties now. So I did Phoenix, yeah. Days of Future Past. Um, yeah, all yeah. of that stuff. Savage Land. Uh, the fir- the second time they went to the Savage Land. So. Yeah. So so I I mean I when I first got that book I was like ten, uh-huh. and so it was like pre-teen, and I read it and enjoyed it and thought I understood it. And it's only when I came back to it years later, I'm like, holy shit, you know, and you realize all of the, the thought that's gone into it, all of the relationships, yeah. you know, and, and the way the characters are written because Claremont basically controlled it all mm. and he understood the characters, you know, the, they were consistent, you know, so when someone does something, you're like, yeah, I totally understand him doing that. So, and, and I, I still, for me, someone like Colossus has not been represented well in any other medium other than the comics. Storm, I think, you yeah. know, uh, has not been represented any anywhere near as well as the, that original Claremont run. So, yeah, just yeah. talking about it now, uh, I, I need to accelerate <laughs> going back and, and yeah, man. Read it um, again. Well, since you brought it up, Cyclops, man, like until yeah. this uh, X Men '97, I have never seen him portrayed as anything more than like a stick in the mud douchebag <laughs> until now, this is the first time. And I knew he had um, a deeper character that they could bring out and they could put the spotlight on this character on film. You know, why wouldn't they? And I, you know, I think Wolverine just kind of stole the show from the beginning. And so they focused mm-hmm. it all on him, made him the POV character from the beginning. And so I, I think a lot of other characters got swept by the wayside, but, thing that's great about x-men is like it's a collection of great characters there's no one standout character it's like they're all pretty awesome in their own right yeah 100 percent. though i do, do you... think cyclops's most baller move was actually when he was with um uh madeline Pryor, and he literally there's a panel where uh it's it's professor x and he's looking at his mail and he's got a postcard and it's literally mm-hmm. uh, Scott and Madeline in their marital, in their honeymoon bed. <laughs> and Scott's just <laughs> like that. It's just the weirdest postcard to send anyone. I have no yeah. idea why they drew that panel. But but I, I in my own head canon, I kind of think like Scott really knows that that uh, yeah. Xavier had a thing for Gene. So, like, yep. you know, there you go, yep. mate. <laughs> yeah it should it should have had like a ps like tell wolverine we said hey yeah exactly. so that, so, yeah yeah tell him he can pine over this picture yeah <laughs> um do you think you think kevin feige is the the claremont of the mcu oh that is a good good question um i we were sort of talking a little bit before uh, and for me, the MCU is almost collapsing under its own weight at the moment. Mm-hmm. And I feel like actually it was Mutant Massacre. Where I just I think it's a little bit, I think that's in the 200s. So that's where they had this real crossover between like Uncanny, X-Force, New Mutants. You know, mm-hmm. they, it, it was a genuine crossover because it needed it. But sales went right up and marvel were like holy shit we need to uh we need to do more of these things so you ended up with yeah. events for the sake of events you know and, and right. how can we loop in this book and so it's almost like happening with that with the movies i i 
say to people I speak to a, a lot, whoever I want to chew the ear off. But no one had ever done what Marvel did with the comics. Yeah. They, it, it was so ambitious. If you think back to that original uh, X-Men trilogy as it was then, they couldn't even keep consistent with that. There's, there's all kinds of continuity problems. These guys, the, the, with the MCU, they, they built to that massive crescendo with, with Endgame. And no one had done anything like that before. And you're yeah. thinking, even to keep the movies going is going to be a monumental feat. I mean, how the hell do you... Yeah. Even just get on par with that. Never mind try and surpass it, which you're always trying to surpass your last last big thing. But instead of just focusing on the movies, they they brought in the the series as well, and mm -hmm. I, I just think it's too much. You know, you get to a point where you know one person can't do all of this stuff, and and yeah. I think he's got to be reliant on a lot of people around him as well. You know, right. but but even then, I just think with the series, it, it's 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 another thing that no one's ever done. I, I can't even think of anything where no. it, anyone's even tried it. But I think that's what you know the MCU is suffering from a, a little bit now. Yeah, so, I, I, not really. I, I, sorry, I didn't answer your question. I think no. he's the closest <laughs> thing to Claremont, but yeah, but Claremont really that. Uh, he had soul control, didn't he? You know, for a right. long time, and and so I, I don't think with movies it, it's more of a collaboration than than sure. it is with comics. You've got the the writer, the artist, the inker, the color, and all of that. The editor, you know, the whole the whole reason Jean Grey got killed off in the first place was an editorial choice, wasn't it? You know, so yeah. and, and then they spent years trying to get this convoluted way where they could absolve gene of genocide you know so they can bring yeah. it back you know but that was the editor's choice so you got a, f a bit of collaboration with comics but with movies it's so much bigger so yeah. i think um he's probably the closest thing we'll ever get to in in the live action world mm -hmm. but uh yeah i think it's i don't think there'll ever be another situation where you've got a, a claim on and and it's so successful as well. I mean, you got things like Savage Dragon, uh, been going for years, haven't they? I, I can't remember the chap's name now, but he, he he's the same guy who, who wrote, yeah. created the character, wrote issue one. He's still writing now. So things like that, I, I think, um, yeah, we'll never get it again in in movies where you have a Claremont. Yeah, I I was just thinking of it in sense of like they so. I feel like Kevin Feige maybe did have more of the control of what was going on when there was less to focus on. As you mm. said, they kind of they started doing all these series and the one the the one off special presentations, and then still doing the same amount of movies every year, three or four movies every year, and that really seems too much for one person to oversee. I think, and it sounds to me like from from what I've read in articles and things about how the MCU was structured and when someone new came in and took over Disney and then now we're back to Bob Iger. I, I, mm. I feel like that maybe during that intermediate period, Feige had less control. Mm. Like he wasn't steering the, the ship as much and maybe we'll get back to that rather than all these independent projects that felt kind of disjointed, not quite connected. They were connected, but they all felt very different, right? Because mm. they were, uh, you know, just people expressing their um, art, right? In different ways, different directors, different uh, writers. And yeah. I don't know. I feel like maybe having one person, kind of like what they're trying to do with James Gunn over with the DCU, right? Mm. Is like, if you can have a person, at least with the vision, the the, mm -hmm. the vision of where they're going and what to do um i'm reading the the mcu book right now that's like the the, the story of the mcu oh wow. and, i didn't know about that one yeah i'll i'll uh i'll send you a link to it it's a uh, it it's pretty cool um yeah, yeah. I, i'm just I'm, I'm just i've heard a lot of excerpts from it but this is just the beginning of it and mm -hmm. um, they're just talking about kevin feige and how he had this massive overreaching vision that everyone felt like there's no way any of that could work because it's just too big. It's too, mm. and, and he kind of like never put limits 
on himself in terms of like how far they could go with it, how much they could expand the universe. Um, the only problem with that is I think you lose a little bit when you've got so much going on that you can't really oversee everything, you know? So, yeah, I mean, if you think about it, they've got the movies, the series, but also the animated stuff. Yeah. Uh, and you've got the, the thing is with the directors when they're coming into an MCU movie, you know, I, I always wonder like, cause especially uh, the lady who did Eternals, I, I can't remember her name, but she come in doing mostly independent film. And can uh -huh. you imagine just coming into Disney where you've got this massive right. machine and we've got, oh, like, you know, this is what I want to do with the action shots. Well, guess again, because we've got a, a CGI team already working yeah. on that. So, you know, and we'll just put the yeah. actors in later. And and so there's there's so many moving parts. I don't know how, other than be that high-level architect, you know, yeah. I, I don't know how you could stay connected with everything, but... I don't think Feige, uh, you know, he didn't have that massive vision, but also managed to keep everything connected, you know, yeah. uh, without being a bit detail focused as well. Otherwise, you have uh, what's his name, Goya, uh, who did mm. Blade and stuff, where where he, he'll kind of get an approximation of you know, a basic idea, and they'll change stuff here, yeah. change stuff there. Whereas Feige was much more into the weeds. And what I liked about the yeah. really early stuff is they, they just seemed to uh, roll with it. They, they seemed to, uh, you know, a lot of the, the Robert Downey Jr. stuff, you know, kicked off the tone of the MCU. Yeah. And uh, Jeff Daniels hated it, didn't he? Uh, sorry, not Jeff Daniels. What was his name? The... Um, Jeff the guy Bridges. I always, yeah, the guy I always mistake for just Jeff Daniels, Jeff Bridges, yeah. <laughs> so he hated it. It's like they don't have anything written. And I'm like, well, they probably just didn't have the dialogue written. They knew what the scenes were going to be. And, and yeah. someone like Robert Downey Jr. massively thrived, whereas he was like, no, I need to know what what is the, you know, I don't know who this Obadiah Stain is. Like, how do I get into the character and whatever? So, so they just seem to fall upwards. You know, they they make these yeah. casting choices and stuff, these writing choices, and like not everything, but most things seem to come off. Whereas, like I say, that it just feels like it's collapsing under its own weight. The only reason they've folded in the series for me is because they're trying to drive Disney Plus subscribers. You know, when it's yeah. all about the movies, it's getting people into the theaters and that's your goal. And we're just focused on that. But yeah, we, we kind of like that. We like the, the box office money, but we really yeah. want people to subscribe to Disney Plus. So we have to keep churning out these series and, and, you know, we want people to be sticky as well. We don't want them to just sign up for a series and then drop off. So we need to keep churning out content. That yeah. is going to be Disney's biggest challenge, I think. How do they keep people subscribe but really put out quality content and i know they they've said haven't they they're going to yeah. focus more on quality but yep. it, it remains to be seen i think also too another part of the story of, of bob Iger coming back in is i i guess they're going to start really focusing on the theme parks again like as a mm. major because that's those theme parks are major money makers for disney like they're yep. the bread and butter or always were the bread and butter of disney was the theme parks mm. and people still love going to their theme parks so I, I guess they're they're going to put a lot more money and intent into like design and and ideas for the theme parks to get people back into the theme park more so than so maybe taking a step back from constantly putting out all sorts of content and only putting out good content and then mm. focusing heavily on getting people into their theme parks to you know, see these characters that they absolutely love from the really good content they're putting out. Mm. That's that's the move. And I, I, I hope that it plays out in the way that they've described they want it to play out. Like, mm -hmm. you know, better content, more focus on the theme parks, making it an experience. That's, that's what I'd love to see. Um, mostly selfishly. I just want to see the great content come back. You know, I don't need a series or a movie every six weeks. I don't need that. It's not that I don't love it. I love having, you know, Marvel content all the time and Star Wars content all the time. Mm. I love having that option. But at the same time, if it's all going to be mediocre instead of 
a couple really good films, I'll take the couple really good films all day. 100%. I mean, I, I never thought I'd have too much Marvel content ever. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, uh, you know, I was only chatting with, with my pod brother, Chris, the, the other week, and, and we, we were going back through Eternals, right? And and mm. for me, again, it's it's not the worst movie in the world, but it, it, no one even who, who's well into the comics, I think, loves the Eternals. It's just kind of there. No, I'd, I'd be surprised if anyone particularly loved them. But even leading up to that, you're thinking, well, you know what? You guys have got my trust. You did this yeah. with Guardians of the Galaxy, and I didn't care about them either. So you know yeah. what? I'm all right. I'm I'm in for this. And then it's like, oh, that's not great. <laughs> and then yeah, I'm okay know, with them yeah. taking. I'm okay with them taking chances, and I'm still yeah. okay with them taking yeah. chances. But it's like everything doesn't have to be a shot in the dark, you know? Yeah. I think they just miss. Um, I mean, let's face it. Downey Jr. and Chris Evans, they they don't have that massive box office draw right now. So again, let's yeah. let's see if they they can bring it back. I really hope they do. But you know, as we referenced the Uncanny X cast and and Rob Briscoe was positive, wasn't he, <laughs> for so long? The, the the comic book bubble will burst. Uh, I'm sure yeah. from about 2009 or something like that. And, you know, yeah. he was always going to be right at some point. It does yeah. kind of feel <laughs> a little bit like that. Yeah, I, I, I'm hoping, I'm praying that the the X-Men will breathe new life into this and that they, they handle it with care. Um, the, the same way that they did with the first three phases of the Avengers mm. storylines. If they can do that with the X-Men... I don't know. I, I could probably die happy entertainment wise. Yeah. I mean, I, I think Deadpool 3 is like literally the perfect way to bring it in. Yeah. And uh, I, I'd almost, I wouldn't mind them spending a few years just separate, you know, just don't really yeah. interact with anyone else. But, you know, there's, there's enough X Men, isn't there, to, to spend a long time at. And, sort of keep the story small i don't need the the space stuff i don't need the mojo verse coming in too early you know just keep yeah. it quite street level and grounded and uh yeah i i think yeah the more i think about it now actually just talking to you i i, I think that movie could flip my enthusiasm back into uh yeah. forward drive again that's my hope. And this series is doing that for me a little bit, even though it's not live action. We don't have any live action X-Men cast yet. Um, it's just, it's, it's getting me excited because I feel like it's going to excite new fans mm -hmm. or, or, or old fans that have kind of lost hope and they go, Oh wait, the X-Men though, you know, they're, they're going to tell some new stories here, brand new characters, brand new actors. They're going to bring in, it could feel like the good old days of the MCU, right? Like discovering, mm -hmm these new actors playing these characters all over again. Um, I've kept you way longer than I said I would. I do want to ask you one. <laughs> I want to ask you one last thing before we go. Did you see uh, the news about the casting of Silver Surfer today? You know, as I saw a comment about it earlier, it's not Norum Rad, is it? It's, it's someone else. So yeah, so it's I, a, just it's a female saw a comment. Yeah. It's a female character um, that was in comics. There was a female sil Silver Surfer at a point. So, like, I don't see why anyone would have an issue with that. They've done this kind of thing in, in, in movies before where they use not quite the same character. Mm. Um, or they'll use a version of the character that isn't the one that you thought it should be. Kind of like mm. uh, Captain Marvel was Carol Danvers. Like, not mm -hmm. Ms. Marvel. She wasn't Ms. Yeah, Marvel. Yeah. She was Captain Marvel, who was originally a... a male character um but so they have cast and i and her name's uh eluding me right now they cast did you watch ozark on netflix nope okay um well there is a character on there named ruth langmore and she's a very uh kind of very pop culture -y character she's like this very uh she's kind of a white trash like trailer park uh dirty mouthed uh kind of redneck 
kind of person, right? Uh, mm -hmm. From the streets. And um, she was one of the best parts about that series. She's fantastic. Um, mm. But she has been cast as Silver Surfer. So maybe look that up uh, later on today and see kind of like her her uh, filmography and stuff and what kind of stuff she's done. But I mean, it seems like a bold choice. It really does. But because I love her character in that show so much, I'm willing to give it a chance. Mm. Also, I'm not a huge like i don't have a lot of skin in the game for for fantastic four so it's yeah, like just, yeah. just just tell me a good story i don't i don't have um there's nothing i need to see from fantastic four you know it's i mean they've had a go they've had a few goes at it haven't they uh, yeah. uh, telling that story and it's it's one of those there's a doubt in my mind whether they're just gonna age well I, I just it's not the originals yeah well just the the idea not the originals sorry but the the characters the idea of having this family yeah. you know this this dysfunctional family and the they're working in the backs of the building and and stuff it, it's just lots of things that i just think how do people relate to that today Mm -hmm. That's what they've failed to do for me. I actually, I quite like the original Roger Corman uh, production yeah. that yeah. wasn't ever released. Um, right. In terms of capturing just the, certainly Doctor Doom, that, that was the best Doctor Doom by far, all, yeah. all the others well, pale in comparison. So, yeah, yeah I, I'm less, I, I don't care for the Fantastic Four, so I'm less excited about them, whereas I'm genuinely excited for the X-Men. Right. But there's a little bit of you know positivity in the back of my mind, which is like, all oh, right, maybe they could do a, a good job of yeah. that. Yeah, I hope. That's what I hope for. I hope for them to make make me care about Fantastic Four. You know, yeah, make like I want to watch this. You know, kind of like I didn't care about really Iron Man, mm -hmm. but I, you know, yeah. I sure like yeah. the character a lot after Downey Jr. portrayed him. So yeah. if they can do that with these characters. Um, I'll be happy, but like I said, I don't have a lot of expectation for it. So mm -hmm. hopefully they just hopefully just do it well. And do you know because I I've taken my eye off the ball here. So in relation, like in terms of the movies coming up, when when are we going to get Fantastic Four? Is it fair? I don't soon? know. Yeah, I don't know. I it, with everything being pushed back, it's got to be though, right? Because it's like the only thing with full casting going on. Like, yeah, um, yeah. everything else is kind of like we have no idea. We don't know any of the X Men. You know, we don't know. Um, I mean, I guess we know about the Blade movie if that ever gets finished. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going on with that, but um, yeah, I, I think the last I heard was twenty twenty six. Right, something okay. like that, okay. twenty twenty five. So all I know that's coming up, you know, is like the stuff like the Avengers films that are coming up, mm -hmm. um, uh, Secret Wars, um, and then what they're gonna do with, you know, Deadpool was coming up. But like mm -hmm. in terms of casting, that's the thing everyone's talking right about right now. So I would assume that's fairly soon. You know, mm -hmm. when are we gonna see an X Men live action film? I have no idea. Like that could be twenty seven. Who knows? <laughs> Well, I mean, we have got one X Man in Deadpool, haven't we? You know, with Wolverine. True. Yeah. Um, yep. So I, I'm, and I'm guessing they'll show other, other people in that. We, you know, we might. I don't know. I've not looked at the casting or whatever, but you know, will we see a, uh, will X twenty three play a more prominent role there? Um, right. I think she's coming back, isn't she? Will we get Jubilee or, you know, there might be something um, in this one. So. I, I, the reason I was asking about Fantastic Four, for me again, if I was Bob Iger, I'd be thinking, well, let's just focus on the X Men for a bit. Yeah. You know, we can keep Fantastic Four in our back pocket. We haven't been successful. Re well, probably the first, what was it, 2005 ish, something, the, the one with yeah. like Jessica Alba and stuff, moderately mm -hmm. successful, successful enough to get a sequel. Yeah, where you got the Silver Surfer, and then it was horrendous, and we got Galactus yeah. as a massive cloud. So you know, just you could leave that one for a few years and just see, just explore the the X Men. You know, I would love for them to to focus on something like the uh, possibly never read it, but like Generation X. 
yeah. was just this whole uh, you know story in there there wasn't really anyone uh, of note in there but it was about mutants living in mutant town and it was about yeah. them just surviving life and and you know getting by so you know there's so much stuff you could do with the x-men but yeah they it sounds like they might still be rushing to to get that content yeah. out there and get this big you know end game to sort of scenario where we're all clambering for it but i'm, I'm just slightly mm. pessimistic that they're going to be able to achieve it a second time round. but i tell you what i'd love to be wrong on that absolutely yeah i'm i'm in the same boat it's like now that you started telling me about x-men stuff deadpool wolverine um now i don't even really care to finish out this phase yeah. of stories <laughs> like i just want we just jump to the next do a fresh start and just just keep rolling uh yeah. but Anyway, um, I will let you go, sir. Thank you so much for uh, for coming on and chatting for way longer than I promised and anticipated. Uh, but I'm happy that you took some time out of your day to come chat with us. And, and the fact that we haven't talked in such a long time, it was great to catch up. It was. It, it was really good to talk to you, Brett. So uh, thank you very much, sir. Enjoy your con that you've got coming up. And, uh, thank good you. Luck. And uh, thank let's not leave it quite so long again. All right. Later, man.